Hello you beautiful misfits, my name is Matt and this is the second of my E3 2017 Blitzkriegs, the joke being of course that they take ages to make. Covering the Microsoft conference, which as we were promised last year, would be Microsoft showing off Project Scorpio in all of its six teraflop doppel what's its glory. And I was curious about how they'd reveal it. Would they do a big dramatic curtain raise? Would they have it descend from the ceiling on wires within a pillar of light? Alas no, it was none of that. The show began instead with a montage about the history of standard video resolutions from 2001 onwards. Oh no, somebody please help me, I cannot contain my erection. Beginning with the good old 640x480 of the original Xbox through to the Xbox 360's standard 1280x720 and the Xbox One's 1920x1080, all supposedly leading to this, with this being 4K Ultra HD. And it didn't end there, oh no, Microsoft also had to show off a big glossy stylized presentation video, set to a musical score sounding suspiciously like a missing track from the most recent Deus Ex. We see the Scorpio being assembled in a black starless void, pulsing with energy as if powered by God's own spunk. Then it spontaneously births characters from various upcoming games, with nothing more than pixel dust and simulated light, including good old Master Chief here. Take a moment to drink this picture in, Halo fans. It's all you're getting in this conference. This young lady then presses the Xbox button on her controller and summons a Balrog of Morgoth. Could have been worse, at least it didn't summon games for Windows Live. <laughs> all this visual bibble, clearly intended to create an association between 4K and immersion within the spongy depths of viewers' brains, culminated in our first glimpse of the console itself, which, as you can clearly see, resembles the love child of an Xbox One Slim and a PlayStation 2. The Xbox One Slim is less than a year old. You dirty fucking nonce. Once this audio-visual indoctrination had concluded, it was then time for Phil Spencer, wearing a specially chosen t-shirt as always, to take the stage and brag about his humongous 4K screen. To those of you with us here in person, watching on this incredible 4K screen. As well as to Pimp Mixer, Microsoft's new streaming service, something I vaguely remember hearing about a few weeks prior, yet didn't pay much attention to. Microsoft were offering prizes and other stuff to people who chose to watch the conference through Mixer, although I really couldn't be asked myself. I was already watching it live on Twitch, as was almost everybody else that watched it live. This is the point where I stopped calling Project Scorpio Project Scorpio, because Phil graciously deigned to give us all its official name. The Xbox One X, or Xbone X, if you prefer to shorten it to a name, just begging to have Sephiroth 420 appended to it. Alternatively, if you smush all the letters together, you get Zabozanex, the name of a trillion years old starborn abomination spoken of in the ancient testament of Karnamagos, the only known remaining copy of which, bound in shark skin and fastened with hasps of human bone, sits in a lead line vault at the British Museum under 24 hour armed guard. As well as an actual name, we also got a release date, November 7th, worldwide this year, followed by a face full of technical specs from Kareem Chowdhury here of Xbox Software Engineering. Kareem mentioned the much hyped 6 teraflopple doppel bollocks of processing power as well as the console's 12 gigadongs of GDDR5 RAM. But what really got the crowd's loins pumping more blood than the elevator scene in The Shining was the mention of 326 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Oh for fuck's sake, all he said was 326 gigabit per second of memory bandwidth. You don't even know what that fucking means, you whooping cocks. Another point Kareem keenly emphasised in his moment in the spotlight here was backwards compatibility. The good news being that all your ordinary, not brand spanking new anymore Xbox One games and accessories will work on the Zabozin X, with added graphical enhancements. Assuming of course a particular game's publisher can be bothered to patch those things in. And for those of you who don't have a 4K TV because you don't piss liquid money, games that support 4K will still look better than normal on your standard 1080p display thanks to a process Kareem calls super sampling. Super sampling is basically what PC gamers have known for years as downsampling and if you don't know what that is don't worry too much about it. I put a link to an informative video about this subject in the description below because I can't do clickable annotations anymore. Thank you, YouTube. <laughs> anyway, that and other guff about things like transistor counts and vapor chambers I couldn't be fucked to pay proper attention to, all allegedly combined to form what Microsoft are calling Voltron, Defender of the Universe. Whoops, 
Wrong clip there. What they're actually calling it is the most powerful console ever made. Although, taking PCs into account, that's kind of like calling a stag beetle the most powerful insect in the elephant enclosure. Technically correct, but not quite so impressive in the wider context. Microsoft are also promising the Xbox One X go and give it to you will deliver games at 4K resolution and 60 frames per second, although not necessarily both at the same time. A little fact Phil and Microsoft kept about as clear and distinct as Japanese pornography on a cracked phone screen smeared with cum. Still, one game definitely confirmed to play in native 4K at 60 frames per second simultaneously is Forza 7. So it's a good thing Microsoft immediately wheeled that out next, wasn't it? Finally, a bloody game. Sure, it's a car game, but I was ready to take anything at this point. So yeah, Forza 7 for Xbox One and Windows 10. A car game about cars in which cars do car things, and generally cars, 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 cars. Oh hey, it's Dan Greenwald! God, feels like forever since I last saw him. And he's not looking like Frankenstein raised him from the dead and pumped him full of coffee and pet pills either. Well, not as much as two years ago at least. Good to see that year off from doing E3 has done him some good. I was starting to worry. Anyway, tell us about the game, Dan. I won't have a clue what you're on about, but I can always pretend. For the first time in history, a flagship supercar is making its world debut here at E3 in front of you. Please, no. Don't do this to me, Dan. This car has never been seen outside of the guarded walls of Porsche. Dan, Dan, look, I'm sorry, mate, okay? I like it a bit, and I'm glad you're looking well-rested, but I really don't care. So I don't have much to comment about when it comes to car games, fair enough. But actual physical cars? What do you want me to say, Dan? It's got four wheels, looks pretty, and I'll never make enough money to own even a sliver of one of its fucking tyres, let alone the whole thing. Anyway, Dan then introduced two professional racers to show off the game. It's got cars and looks very pretty, especially the rain effect. From this point on, the conference kicked things up a gear or two, no pun intended, with Phil here returning briefly to promise the largest and I believe the most diverse lineup of games that we've ever shown on our Xbox E3 stage. And I'm very pleased to say he wasn't fibbing. From this point on, the conference was a veritable barrage of games, one after the other. Bang, 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 bang. So forgive me if it seems like I'm rushing through this a bit in places. Speaking of Russian, the barrage began with the world premiere for Metro Exodus, a brand new spiffy instalment in the bleak post-apocalyptic Metro series, only not looking quite so tightly confined to the Moscow Metro system this time. You'll still be scrambling for shotgun shells deep beneath the earth, of course, but as this demo shows, you'll also get to stretch your legs above ground too. Without a gas mask no less, which is a pretty big deal in the Metro universe, trudging across relatively wide, open spaces, more than a teeny bit reminiscent of Get out of here, Stalker. Which isn't a huge surprise considering the Stalker games were one of the main inspirations for the original Metro 2033 novel by author Dmitry Klukovsky. Nor is it in any way a bad thing whatso Kravavi ever. Completely the opposite, actually, obviously. The demo on show here was very heavily choreographed, however, Featuring dramatic escapes from troglodytical monstrosities and an equally dramatic appearance from Big Mutant Russian Bear. It was, however, also interspersed with things like checking your map and compass, poking around in abandoned buildings, and shooting dogs in the neck with a crossbow. In short, the only thing I didn't like about this was the 2018 release date, because bodgy and moy do I love me a fix of Eastern Bloc bleakness. After that, we jumped almost immediately to Sunya Climbs, way back in time, with Assassin's Creed Origins. Yep, Assassin's Creed is back, fresh from a gap year spent presumably poking around the pyramids because this new instalment is all about ancient Egypt, baby! Yes! <laughs> Finally! And still no feudal Japan. Don't you give me that look. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you sad because it's not set in feudal Japan? Gosh, you're absolutely right. If only that historical setting wasn't so chronically underrepresented, eh? I mean, it's not like there's been a heavenly fucking mountain worth of games about ninjas released since the dawn of video games, is there? No, no, please. Accept 1000 apologies for my liking the look of a setting not so commonly represented in games of this ilk, and convey them post-haste to the floating bridge of heaven for me. 
because how dare I be just a teeny bit excited at the prospect of scaling the majestic pyramids of Giza rather than clawing my way up yet another generic cocking pagoda built entirely of fucking nightingale floors. Look, don't take it personally, okay? I like ninjas as well. I also like bacon sandwiches, but even I'd get bored of having one for breakfast every single day. It'll take a while, but I would eventually get bored of them. At some point in the future. Possibly a very distant one. I really like bacon sandwiches. Haven't had any in ages. Anywho, as Creed Oregano's creative director Jean Guizdon came out on stage to talk about it a bit, although that mostly just amounted to him saying it's got RPG elements now. But better to leave early than outstay your welcome I suppose, and he did cap off his appearance with some gameplay footage, edited for time, in which our protagonist, Bayek, returns to his hometown of Siwa to rid it of a turbulent priest. I mean Oracle. Whatever, they're practically the same thing. One notable change on show is that instead of the blue filtered eagle vision of old, you telepathically control an actual eagle to scout out your targets. Other new additions seen in the demo include colour coded loot drops and some enemies being too high a level to take on or instantly kill from stealth. That last one being a change I'm personally somewhat torn over. On the one hand, it does counter the issue in previous titles of being able to massacre entire armies of elite goons in a straight fight without breaking a sweat, which isn't something I tend to associate with stealthy assassins. On the other hand, I'm not really keen on artificial restrictions about whom I can or cannot instantly necky stabby murder kill. It isn't a complete deal breaker though, hell, they had me as soon as they showed some pyramids. And lines like Tip the balance of Anubis just make me want it even more. Because who wouldn't want to be an agent of death and murder for Mr. Jackal from American Gods? Continuing along a running theme of killing, the next game on show was Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, which every PC gamer and their bloody dog have been harping on about for ages now. For what I understand are very good reasons, I just haven't had the time, money, or inclination to try it myself. Sorry. In what is something of a genuine coup for Microsoft, PUBG as it's more commonly abbreviated to, will be coming to all flavours of Xbox One later this year. They even got player unknown himself, Brendan Green, who seems a very nice chap indeed, to come on stage and describe the general premise. God, this is awkward. It's going to be really tricky to keep calling him player unknown when I know what he looks like and what his name is. It's not so much peering at the man behind the curtain as tearing the curtains down and setting them on fire kind of ruins the magic a bit. Anyway, for you darling console people who may not know what Player Unknown's Battlegrounds is, imagine the movie Battle Royale without Takeshi Kitano, but with a hell of a lot more frying pans. In a nutshell, you and up to 100 other players are airdropped onto a remote island to murder each other with whatever weapons you can find, be they guns, cars, or indeed frying pans, with the winner being the last person standing. You can't get much simpler than that, can you? So let's move on. To some sweet sounding synthwave preceding the appearance of Deep Rock Galactic which is apparently coming to Xbox One even though it's been in Steam Early Access for a wee while now and is not due for release until next year. Still it does look somewhat interesting in a Minecraft meets Pitch Black by way of Lord of the Rings with a passing glance at No Man's Sky kind of way. After that we got State of Decay 2 which is of course a ugh, zombie game because those haven't been done completely to I mean flogged like a I mean completely overdone to the point of tedium. Although despite being another zombie game, State of Decay Part Zvi Electric Boogaloo at least puts some emphasis on the whole survival part of zombie survival, what with it being a sandbox survival game like its predecessor. The sequel will also apparently allow for co-op play with up to four players, so at least there'll be some people you can possibly trust long enough to get shit done. Or not, depending on the company you keep. We then got a look at The Darwin Project, a cartoony in an Overwatch style survival game from Scavenger Studio where players with different sets of powers and weapons track and murder each other within a remote Canadian forest. Personally, I was quite intrigued to see the sort of game touting tracking mechanics somewhat deeper than bunny hop towards the sound of gunfire and shoot every motherfucker you see. Alas, much of the interest I might have had in this game was stabbed in the face, dragged into a remote forest and buried in a shallow grave by this shout casting twonk bellowing over the proceedings. A play from the wounded warrior. She was kind of trapped, but she used superior tactics to get herself out of there. She's going to take the win. Let's move on to the next arena. Which is a pity as I rather dug the general concept, particularly the game's show director mode in which, similar to the Hunger Games, an actual living, breathing person 
can influence the game to give underdogs an advantage, reveal the location of more proficient players by calling a manhunt on them, and other nasty tricks. After that came the omnipresent shadow of Minecraft, namely an announcement for the upcoming Better Together update, which will add cross-platform play with Nintendo Switch and PC versions, as well as in-game servers across all platforms, a community marketplace selling skins, and other cosmetic guff PC players take freely for granted. Perhaps most pointlessly of all, however, was the addition of, and I shit you not, 4K HDR graphics. Improved lighting, shadows, water effects, the works. Yes, for Minecraft. Because one naturally associates Minecraft with beautiful photorealistic graphics, don't they? I mean, shit, what next? Manic Miner 4K? Hover Bother UHD? Christ, I'm fucking old. Coming out on stage to discuss all this was, oh god, it's scary eyed Lydia Winters and her soul stealing death grin. Uh, 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 Bankrock, Pargon, Santax, Pargon, Pargon, Mantrock, Pargon. Okay, that should protect what's left of my soul for a little while longer. Fortunately, the Dark Empress Lydia of terrifying cheerfulness only lingered long enough to tell you pretty much the exact same thing I just did, so moving on to Phil Spencer, who reappeared to discuss third-party franchises and introduce a bunch of games available to pre-order on the Xbox Store straight away, such as... Oh, it's bloody Dragon Ball, in it? Dragon Ball Fighter Z, to be exact. A 2D fighter that could be quite fun for all I know, except I don't give even a single Hawaiian king about the Dragon Ball universe. When it comes to adaptations of Wu Chengen's Journey to the West, I'll stick with... Thank you very much. Next up was another exclusive that looked rather pretty, kind of a fantasy dealy that also looks a wee bit, oh it's Black Desert Online, that MMO I keep getting emails about, never mind. After that came The Last Night, the reveal of which caused rather a positive stir for its quite lovely looking visuals, a cyberpunk side scroller drenched in more neon than an 80s nightclub and, oh, that's a pity. Sorry to break this to you all folks, but apparently that visually interesting game you all just saw there is literally Hitler. Indeed, the almost universal praise and hype for the last night quickly turned to splinter divisive bickering when it turned out the game's developer chose a, shall we say, controversial position during that whole Gamergate ruckus. So, no matter how good it looks or how well it plays, in some people's minds it will be forever tainted by that. As for me personally, well, I'll pass judgement if and when I get to play it. All I'll say for now is, while the game certainly looks quite lovely, its premise of a future where creativity has been ruined by universal basic income is narratively rather flimsy. You see, contrary to what the developer might believe, it does actually take more than a lack of mercenary profit motive to kill people's desire to create things. In fact, it barely even registers when you consider things like chronic soul-crushing depression or excruciating physical pain throughout your entire nervous system. Yet, even they don't stop some people. Honestly, if human creativity was so heavily dependent on how much money you could make from it, then, well, you wouldn't be watching this video right now, because it wouldn't exist. And yet it does, doesn't it? It exists because I enjoyed making it. Do you think Thog, the hypothetical ancient caveman, gave two shits how many mammoth skins he'd get from scribbling on his cave wall? Of course he didn't. Thog likely did it for primitive, deeply personal reasons, like the sheer fucking enjoyment of it. Nor did it mean he couldn't still strangle a bear for its meat and fur if he had to. Anyway, after that came a trailer for The Artful Escape, in which a man with a glowing guitar rocks out in the woods, and that's all I can really say about it, except that it'll be coming out, and I quote, when it's damn ready. Incidentally, I do think it was rather good of Microsoft to sprinkle indie titles like this amongst bigger, better known titles, instead of segregating them all into some idiot Xbox ghetto. So kudos for that. Anyway, hot on the heels of The Artful Escape came the trailer for Code Vein, that anime Dark Souls alike from Banana Damco, some of you might have already heard about. Although it's probably fairer to call it a Bloodborne alike than a Souls alike, given the comparatively swift pace of the combat on display here. The post apocalyptic modern day environments, on the other hand, remind me very strongly of Darksiders, right down to the big spiky stalagmites jutting out of the buildings. It could be interesting, but to be blunt, I am a wee bit Souls out at the moment. It's not coming out till next year though, so I might be up for it by then. Phil Spencer then reappeared to let us catch our breath for a moment before introducing us all to some brand new gameplay footage of YAR IT BE SEA THIEVES It's gonna explore sunken wrecks for plunder Run a boat on remote islands like a landlubber Fight the scurvy undead Stuff bananas into your mouth in a- that, that, That's not how you eat a banana Matter it, Dios, you could at least peel it first Put yourself out of cannons Delve into the earth like a worm or mole 
Dig up even more precious booty, then run away with the loot and leave your stupid crewmates to be eaten by the hungry dead, like the bilge rats they are, and I, I mean, wait for them to make their escape and join you so you can all divvy up the booty. Nice and equally like. Shite. No one's gonna want to be sailed with me now. So yar, I be loving what I see and feeling the siren call of the ocean inside me black heart. The only thing stopping me from pre-ordering this straight away is that the PC version be exclusive to Windows 10. <coughs> so I can drop the accent now, thank god. After that salty delight came a tiny flicker of Tacoma from the creators of Gone Home, which was so brief I literally missed the release date by blinking. It's August the 2nd by the way. I had to google that. That brief spark of Tacoma was followed by... Wait, this isn't a new Conquer game, is it? No, no it can't be. There's clearly no swearing, innuendo, or toilet opera. How about some scat, you little twat? It's Super Lucky's Tale, which looks... I don't know. Not my cup of tea, but some of you might like it. After that, however, came Cuphead for the upteenth time. I still like the look of it, really, I do, but I'm getting just a wee bit impatient about the lack of a release date. Okay, never mind, there's the release date. Sorry. Motherfucker. I said I was sorry. That's why we brought in you. You got the talent. Oh, Terry, you're too kind. Terry Crews aside, Crackdown 3 looks very much like a Crackdown game. Cartoony violence, lots of things blowing up, general chaos and mayhem, big old weapons, and collecting glowing balls from rooftops. Enough said, really. From that Technicolor assault on the senses, we then dived face first straight into another one by way of a montage of indie games that Microsoft hadn't let out of the ID at Xbox enclosure. We had Osiris New Dawn, Raiders of the Broken Planet, Unruly Heroes, Path of Exile, Battle Right, Surviving Mars, Fable Fortune, Observer, Robocraft Infinity, Dunk Lords, Minion Masters, Brawl Out, Ooblets, Dark and Night, Strange Brigade, River Bond, Hello Neighbor, Shift, and Conan Exiles. Whereupon the pace slowed back down to a more comfortable level again with another look at Ashen. No, not that one. The one we saw two years ago that looked a bit like Dark Souls crossed with Shadow of the Colossus and a smidgen of Little Big Adventure, aka Relentless Twinson's Adventure. It still looks like that, although this trailer gives us a little bit more of the overall story. Our bold, faceless, literally, protagonist must traverse a grim, sunless realm of misery and despair. Much like the Kentish town of Sittingbourne, on a quest for something called the New Light, with which they may secure a new home for themselves and what remains of their people while fighting all sorts of monstrous denizens along the way in a very obviously Dark Souls style -y. I'm honestly more keen for this one than I am for Code Vein, since anime art styles don't inherently make me squeal with joy like a chimp with its dick in a melon. Plus, I'm curious to see how a much smaller team with a far smaller budget handles these kinds of Souls-like elements. Things got brighter, more modern and more confusing for my ancient calcified brain with the reveal of Life is Strange Before the Storm, a prequel to the popular Life is Strange with the same protagonist, Chloe Price, only this time without the time manipulation powers, what with it being a prequel. It also doesn't have Ashley Birch voicing Chloe this time, due to contractual complications arising from the sag strike. She is still working on the game as a story consultant however, which is certainly one way of getting around union restrictions without being labelled a filthy scab. Even so, I still probably won't be playing this to be honest, much as I haven't played the first one. Not because I think it will be bad or anything, no, not at all, it's just whenever I consider maybe playing the first one, I'll watch a trailer for it and then feel immediately hideously fucking ancient. I overcame my creeping feelings of decrepitude just in time to catch a rare occurrence during this conference, the appearance of a human being, specifically Michael DePlater from Monolith, with a whole wad of Shadow of War aka Shadow of Mordor 2, aka Wardor footage, to show us. Specifically about how Monolith have expanded the Nemesis system from the first game, which I paid more than some attention to because I really like the Nemesis system. This time round, not only will your potential Nemesis... 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 Not only will your potential Nemesis grow in power, get into fights and pop up in the worst possible places at the worst possible times, like they did in Shadow of Mordor, in Shadow of War they'll actually stalk you across the lands, ready to ambush you in the middle of nowhere, which I think adds a rather nice dollop of paranoia to the proceedings. This time round you'll also be able to raise whole armies of orcs against the Dark Lord Sauron himself, with some of those orcs being very big indeed, as well as lay siege against Sauron's strongholds and explore new regions like Sirith Ungol. On a completely unrelated note, at the exact same time this presentation was being shown, every seismometer within 100 miles of Wolvercott Cemetery in Oxford 
spontaneously exploded, for some utterly inexplicable reason. The capstone for this whopping great onslaught of games was a nice bit of light piano music from Gareth Coker, composer on Ori and the Blind Forest. It also doubled as an announcement for the sequel, Ori and the Will of the Wisps, which would have been lovelier had the information not been leaked hours before. It does look absolutely fucking gorgeous though, much like the first one, although I'm not too keen on this spider here because all spiders are, of course, unholy abominations from the nightmare pits of terror that I'll gladly murder. Oh no! It's a sad baby owl! Please don't be sad, baby owl. <laughs> I'm sorry your giant adoptive skeksis parents are dead. <laughs> <laughs> now where were we? And with that frankly rather lovely combination of sweet piano music and melancholy juvenile nocturnal predators, the show was a... Hang on a second. Weren't we promised to look at Anthem from Bioware? Indeed we were, and indeed we did get it, eventually, albeit deployed as a smokescreen to distract from the retail price of the Xbox One X, which Phil casually dropped along with his mic, metaphorically speaking. The world's most powerful console at $499. $499? $499 euros? A bushel of looted grain and your firstborn child? Yeah, I can see that price putting some people off, don't you? I mean... Sure, it's a dedicated gaming machine, optimised for that sort of thing, and thus a comparatively cheap way of getting a PC gaming-like experience, but it's not quite the same, is it? Really? At all? Ever? Thing is, if you're the sort of person obsessed with 4K resolution at 60fps, then you're probably also the sort of person squirrelling away every penny you can scrounge for a beast of a PC. Alas, before we could dwell too deeply on such things, Phil threw EA's Patrick Soderlund in our face like a human smoke bomb and made his dastardly escape. Patrick was here to talk a bit, before bringing on a chap called John Warner, who had the duty of presenting Anthem. A new IP from Bioware's Edmonton studio, founded by Casey, let's just scribble the ending on a beer mat and call it a day, Hudson, before he swanned off to Microsoft. At first glance, Anthem clearly looks to have enjoyed a lion's share of the Bioware budget, while Mass Effect Andromeda was presumably left licking mould from a cellar wall for sustenance. Now before you hardcore Bioware fans, or what's left of you, moisten your pants at the prospect of a new RPG extravaganza, Anthem is not an RPG. Not in the traditional Bioware sense at least. Don't let the third person perspective fool you, Anthem is best described as EA's answer to Destiny. A co-op multiplayer experience with lots of shooty shooty bang bang customizable power armor and, quite likely, very little human on alien relations. As well as environments that might not scream return to mission area at you if you dare to try and explore them. There's also a smidgen of Ubisoft's The Division chucked into the mix, and I'm not explicitly talking gameplay either. Have you been in there yet? I haven't. Oh, we should do that later with Kim. <laughs> yeah, he could use the XP. Hello, treasure. Yep, EA outright stole Ubisoft's whole, totally authentic, honest multiplayer players shtick, whereby paid actors pretend to be real players who've had every swear word they ever learned chemically scoured from their brains. I don't know, it could be good? Maybe? At least Bioware might put more than a token effort into conveying a decent in-game story from the outset, which is more than Bungie did with Vanilla Destiny. Plus, since it's probably intended to run and run and run and run a la Destiny, there likely won't be a definitive ending for someone like Casey Hudson to mess up. Although credit where it's due, Mass Effect Andromeda, despite its flaws, best ending of the series. Anyway, if Anthem has a solid single player component, then you can consider me tentatively interested. Otherwise, I can take it or leave it. And with that, the show was finally, finally, finally over after a whopping 1 hour and 45 minutes making this the longest conference at this year's E3. Despite my overall grumbling, however, and the drawn-out length of this summary video, it honestly didn't feel that long. The sheer volume of games on display, being a healthy mix of AAA and smaller budget affairs, helped the time fly by. Microsoft also paced the conference in a way that it didn't feel too overwhelming, although it did get quite perilously close at times. Also, the little breaks in the raw gameplay that actually involved real flesh and blood people didn't outstay their welcome, with the possible exception of Dan Greenwalt moonlighting for Porsche, more's the pity. Overall, however, this was a strong showing for Microsoft, quite possibly their strongest since the Xbox One's launch. The conference had a lot of meat to it, and very little in the way of airy filler, although your tastes may vary considerably from mine. 
From my perspective, this was Microsoft coming out fighting, again. Although with little to none of these slight air of desperation from previous conferences. On the contrary, it conveyed a palpable sense of newfound confidence, of a company that's finally found its footing after a somewhat wobbly start to this generation. Although the whole idea of console generation seems rather pointless now, Phil & Co struck quite a fine balance between depicting the Xbox One X as a brand new console and selling it as an iPhone-esque upgrade, still able to run all the games you already have for your Xbox One Ordinary with little to no adjustment. Microsoft at least appeared to be more on top of the whole idea of console hardware iterations than Sony seemed to. Whether this strategy will pay off for them in the long run, however, depends on whether or not Xbox players can stomach forking out almost $500 for a new iteration that may or may not be deemed obsolete within a year or two. For the time being, however, Microsoft can take some well-deserved credit for a more than tolerable conference, dare I say it, even enjoyable in places. So with that done, it's on to the rest of the E3 conferences, three of which are mercifully quite short in comparison to this behemoth. That includes the Bethesda conference, which I'll be covering for you next, for my many and varied sins. Until then, however, which hopefully won't be too long, you can go now. 